passage of scripture in Galatians chapter 5 and uh, tonight I want to just uh, I just want to try to be a real help to you tonight um, I've, I've, I've said a little bit about my testimony I was saved at the age of five at the Haven Baptist Church in Haven Kansas and um, shortly after that uh, a friend of mine introduced me to a, a sin as a six-year-old boy that I, I, got, I got sucked into. And, um, and that sin, uh, that sin had a, a stronghold on my life and did a lot of damage to me until I was about 19 years of age. I finally got the victory. So about 13 years of battling that. It caused me to doubt my salvation. Um, it caused a lot of things in my life. And I ran from preacher to preacher to preacher to preacher trying to get some help. Uh, I thought I was lost because of the things that I had done. I thought I was lost because of the way the devil was attacking my mind and planting thoughts in my mind. And, and I went to preacher after preacher after preacher, and they would take me through the plan of salvation. You know, you're a sinner, and the penalty for sin is hell, and Christ died for our sins, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you want to go to heaven, you've got to accept Christ as Savior. And I would say to them, I, I did that. And they would say, well, then, then you're saved. And they were telling me the truth. Uh, but I didn't have peace. And so I, I made several professions of faith. And even as I was teaching a full-time Christian servant, teaching in a Christian school, I got, quote, saved again and baptized again, all because of the attacks that Satan was bringing upon my life. I want to say to you tonight that you and I have an enemy called the devil. Amen. And the Bible says that he walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, not whom he can devour. If you're saved, the devil can't devour you, but you can give him, you give him permission by the way you respond to him. You allow him to have his, his, his power over you if you don't learn how to deal with it. And I, I don't know. I think my preachers probably talked on what I'm going to preach on tonight. They probably taught it, and I just didn't listen. I didn't hear it, you know, uh, you know how we go, and when you're a young person, you go to church and you learn how to zone out and put your mind a thousand miles away somewhere, or you play the little game in church with the little dots and put the line and put the line, put the line, put the line, put your initial in there, and, and you, you write notes and you, you wave at your girlfriend and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I'll just to be honest with you, I mean, I was a saved, but I was a backslidden, carnal Christian, and that's just where I was. And, uh, and so tonight, I want to I wanna talk to you a little bit about the battle with temptation and sin. The battle with temptation and sin. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 with me. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And Brother Howard preached on that and did a great job. But look at verse 17. For the flesh, lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, these are contrary the one to the other. Watch the next statement. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, here the Bible says that we are to walk in the Spirit. The Spirit is what we get when we accept Christ as Savior. Amen? Before you got saved, you did not have the Spirit of God. The Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in. The Bible says, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And so when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came into your life and indwelt your life. He's called the earnest payment, and he's, he's called the seal. The word earnest there means uh, you put down earnest money if you go buy a car, for instance. I'm going to go over buy this car, and I don't have enough money to pay for it. So I give them $500, and that's a promise from them that I'm going to come back, and I'm going to pay the purchase price for that car. I'm going to take it. Well, Jesus has come back to get us someday, and so when we got saved, God gave us the Holy Spirit. That's the earnest. That's the promise from God that I'm coming back to get you. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And we got the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we were sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. So when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in. He became your earnest. And he also became the seal. That word seal there is like a seal on a document. In those days, to make a document official, 
they would take some wax and they would put this wax, they'd melt it and they'd put on this document and then they would take a signet or a stamp just like you have on your birth certificate to make it a legal birth certificate and that seal was a guarantee that you're the genuine thing, amen? And so what guarantees that you and I are saved is not that we live sinless but that we have accepted Christ as Savior and when we accepted Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit came in. Now, if the Holy Spirit is not in you, then you're not saved, amen? Well, how do I know the Spirit's in me because He bears witness with me that I'm the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God that's in you. You see, a lost person doesn't have that voice. When I was running around with the lost guys, yeah, they didn't have a voice telling them, go, don't go do that. They didn't have a voice telling them, this is wrong because you're a Christian, you know better. They didn't have that. The lost natural man does not have that. The Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of God. For they are spiritually discerned. So a lost person does not have that voice of God in there saying, look, you're a Christian, you know better. You know you shouldn't lie. You know you shouldn't cheat. You know you shouldn't steal. You know you shouldn't. And, and you, you, you fill in the blank, amen, of the things that you're battling with. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that we're to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now, we all have a sin or sins that easily beset us. Uh, I could tell you what my besetting sin is, but it's none of your business. Amen? And you can tell me what your besetting sin is, but it's really none of my business. Amen? Now, some people's sins seem to be worse than others. Amen? I mean, for instance, some guy's sin is pornography. Some guy's, some guy's sin is lying. And we might say, well, lying's not as bad as pornography, but both of them are sins. Amen? And both of them are wrong. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 says, the fearful and the unbelieving shall go to hell. And all liars shall go to hell. And all murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. And God doesn't say here, well, because it's a lying problem, it's not as bad as a pornography problem. Amen? I mean, sin is sin, and we all have a battle with sin. Amen? And so here the Bible teaches us that here's the battle that we're in. We're to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusteth. That means, that means desires. Uh, desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary one to the other. They're not the same. The spirit will never lead you to desire to, to do the, the sin. And the, and the flesh will never lead you to the desire to do right. They're contrary. He goes on in that passage to give you the works of the flesh. If you want to look very quickly. In verse number 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, those are all sexual sins, idolatry, witchcraft, those are all worshiping sins, uh, those, are, those are getting involved in the occult or worshiping other things, then hatred. Variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, these are all ar fighting and arguing sins, and then envyings, you know, uh, jealousy falls in that, murders drunkenness, revelings, that's just wild parties and the such like. These are the works of the flesh. And I think everybody in here knows that Christians aren't supposed to do those things, amen? I don't have to spend time tonight to tell you that we shouldn't lie, we shouldn't cheat, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't cuss, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't kill people, we shouldn't, we shouldn't get in fist fights, and well, we shouldn't have, uh, run our uh, uh, mouths and say ugly things to people, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, hate, we shouldn't have anger problems, we shouldn't have all that stuff. Stuff, all right, but that's what we have. We're in a battle. The scripture is given by inspiration of God, and Galatians was written to church people, not a preacher. You know, I say this often, and I say this when I'm when I'm out on the road because I feel like that today's Christianity wants to throw everything on the preacher. Well, the preacher should be this way. The preacher should be that way. But there's only three books written to the preacher. First and Second Timothy and Titus, that's it. The rest of them are written to all the rest of us, amen? And this passage of Scripture was written to the Christian. Christian, you need to walk in the Spirit. In fact, in, this, in Ephesians, the Bible says we're to be filled with the Spirit. As a Christian, if you're not filled with the Spirit tonight, you're sinning. There are two types of sin. There are sins of commission. That means doing things that you were told not to do. That's committing something you are told not to do. There are sins of omission. That means not doing what you were told to do. For instance, I'm told not to steal, so if I go steal, that's a sin of commission. But I've been told to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I don't do that, that's a sin of omission. 
Sin is not doing what you should do and is doing what you shouldn't do. Amen? And now you, none of you here tonight better tell me you don't sin. For the Bible says in the book of 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Every person here this evening is a sinner. Amen? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen? And like Dr. Johnny Pope preached a sermon one time, don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. He says, most of us run around going, run, run around going saying, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. But he says, we should say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. He says, you know, some basketball player fouls. You don't see him run over to the, ca uh, over the camera and say, oh, I'm just a fowler. Please forgive me. I'm just a fowler. No, he's a basketball player who fouls. Amen. You and I are Christians who sin. Amen. It's a better way to look at it. You know, I'm not lost because I'm because I sin. I need you to understand that. You see, because the devil he likes to tell you because you have this sin nature, and because you have these thoughts, and because you have these desires, and because sometimes you do what you shouldn't do or don't do what you should do, then that means you're not saved, and that's not true. This was written to believers, and he said to the believers, I want you to walk in the Spirit. And here's why. Are you going to fulfill the lust of the flesh? In other words, you're going to do the sinful things. And he said, here's the reason why. For, that's what the word for there tells you what he, uh, uh, explains what he just said. For, here's the law. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That is an immutable law that happens. It is an immutable truth. You are never going to live one day of your life without the flesh trying to draw you to sin. You're not going to do it. Well, these Christians are perfect. No, Christians are not perfect. We're forgiven. Amen. We are striving for perfection. We are working at, at, at the best that we can with our strength and God's help to live a perfect life. I said to Dironic, come over. I said this 26 years ago. If living Christian was easy, everybody do it. And it's not easy to live Christian because we have a sin nature. Amen and amen. It's a battle, the battle with temptation and sin, the Bible tells us here. It's a real battle, and it is a confusion to many new Christians. Many times when a person gets saved, they think that I'm, now I'm saved, I won't sin anymore. They think that I'm going to be perfect, and they think that everybody that's a Christian is perfect. And then when they come face to face with the fact that I still have these thoughts, and I still say these words, and I still do these things that I shouldn't do, then maybe I didn't truly get saved. Well, listen to me. The Bible tells us if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, old things are become new. And a lot of people then want to use that verse to say if you got saved, everything in your life is going to be, you're going to lose all your sin stuff. But you know what became new? The desire became new. Paul said, I desire after the things of God in my heart now. Before he was saved, he didn't desire those things. He desired the flesh. Before you're saved, you desire the, the liquor and the sex and the lying and the stealing and, and the, what the world has to offer and what the flesh wants to do. But when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes in, you get a new desire, a desire to do right. And that desire, the Spirit, is drawing you or lusting which is a desire lusting against the flesh the old man the old man the bible calls it the new man i hope you understand what i'm saying when i got saved i didn't lose my sin nature the flesh is still there but when i got saved i got a new nature that moved in the spirit of god and that new nature wants me and works in me and puts a desire in me to do right but i still have the desire within me to do wrong that's the area that the devil can use to tempt me to sin and, and, and to violate my, 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 my God's commandments. And so that's what this is talking about here uh, in this passage of Scripture. And so it, it, it's a battle. We're in a battle. Often when a person gets saved, they have the impression they will live like a Christian. Certainly the heart and spirit has been changed, a total difference and desire and affected, but it is troubling when they recognize they're still having difficult in a battle with sin. Can I tell you that I battle every day with sin? Can I tell you there's not a day in my life that I don't battle sin? Can I take that a little further? I battle multiple times, sometimes almost constantly all day long with the, with the temptations and the desires that, that the devil places and the flesh and the world places in my life. Now, I don't commit those things, but they are there. It's like a thought that runs through your mind. You know what I'm saying? And like you're just sitting here and all of a sudden this thought runs through your mind like, 
Why don't you do this? Well, it's not what God wants me to do. Well, where did that thought come from? That's the spiritual battle. Can I tell you that all of the spiritual battle is fought right here? It's fought in your thought processes. You'll never do anything and for the, except the thought comes first. The devil can't do anything but plant a thought in your mind. All he can only do is wave something in front of you that will cause you to think something. And, and you have to figure out in your life what are the things that are being used to cause you to be tempted and then you have to decide that I need to do something about those things so that I am no longer tempted. Gary Coleman gave this illustration. He had a deacon in his church, a godly man, because you can't be a deacon unless you're a godly man. Obviously, he's godly enough to become a deacon. He came to Brother Coleman's office one day, and he said, Pastor, he said, I just got to confess something. He said, I just have a terrible time with pornography. And, 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 uh, and, and, and can I tell you something? Listen to me. Uh, uh, don't be killing and condemning people. Look, you know, if you want everybody to know your, your business, you know, we want to wave everybody's dirty laundry out and criticize and condemn us. Well, how about let's wave your dirty laundry out? Amen, you want that? The other day, that Minnesota Viking kicker, he missed that field goal that would have won him the championship game. And you know that people started threatening him and calling him all kinds of names and threatening his family and everything. And some sports writer wrote this thing. He said, look, you know, nobody feels worse than he does. How would you like for all of your mistakes to be aired before the people? Now, that boy, that's pretty good stuff. Even a guy may not be Christian, pretty good stuff. You know, it's time we Christians quit shooting each other. It's time we Christians start helping each other, amen, and praying for one another. And if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Don't ruin them. Amen. I had a man in my church pastor for many years. He messed up. He messed up big time, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 and he couldn't be a pastor anymore. That's just the way it was. But I was the first one, I believe, to call him and said, Brother, I don't know what happened, but all I can think is maybe I would have been a better friend. It wouldn't have happened. And then I went and visited him when he was in prison, and he came to be a member of my church, and he became a very good member of my church. And I got criticized for loving the guy. Can you tell me what are you supposed to do? He messed up. He confessed it. He wasn't arrogant about it. He didn't try to hide it. He knew he did wrong. Listen, I, how many wrongs have I done? How many wrongs have you done? I'm glad nobody is, is, is counting my wrongs. Amen. In fact, I'm glad most people don't know them. Amen. They're under the blood. Amen. Forgiven, cast behind his back as far as the east is from the west to be remembered against me no more. Amen. But we got this battle we're in. Amen. Got this battle. This battle it can, 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 can and does create discouragement. It creates defeat, disappointment, doubt, destruction. It robs many Christians of peace, joy, confidence, blessing, and victory. In my own life, my wife could tell you that it almost put me into a nervous breakdown. I mean, Satan was after me with both barrels, amen? I mean, he was trying to destroy this man. He, he, I, 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 I'm telling you, I thought that God had cast me away. I had all these thoughts going through my head, negative thoughts, unbiblical thoughts. Can I tell you that when the devil puts a thought in your mind, you can figure it out it's the devil's thought because it's an unbiblical thought. Amen. It's a lie against the Scripture. For instance, God left you. That's a lie. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. And that was a lie to me. God left you. You're not saved. That's a lie. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And he that believeth on the Son hath life. Amen. And I, had, and I had life. And the devil was lying to me. Amen. And he was attacking me. And he was using my past as a tool against me. Can I tell you, dear friend, uh, that, uh, that, that one of the reasons why we have doubts is because we don't live as godly as we should? And the Bible says in the book of 1 John chapter, I can't remember what chapter, but it says we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It doesn't say we know him if we keep his commandments. My knowing Christ as my Savior has nothing to do with me keeping the commandments. It has to do with the day I was born again, amen? But I know that I know him if I keep his commandments. When I'm not doing right, I begin to doubt. When people come to me with doubting their salvation, I say there's only one of two things. Either you're not, either you're not saved or you got sin you're not dealing with. And I mark her down, doubt comes from those two areas. Amen? 
you're not saved or you don't understand that you're saved or you have sin in your life and that sin is causing you to doubt. Amen? And, you know, because we think, if I'm a Christian, I shouldn't live this way. And that's true. But we're in a battle with temptation and sin. Amen? Are you with me tonight? If upon the moment of getting saved, we could become perfect with no sin or no desire for sin, it would be so wonderful. Wouldn't it be nice, Brother Ken, the day you got saved, if you never had another evil thought? Wouldn't it be nice if you never, Ken probably doesn't lose his temper like I used to, but it, but it'd be glad, wouldn't you be glad the day you got saved you never got angry and flew off the handle? Wouldn't it be glad you got saved you never said something you regret, amen, or you never let out an expletive deleted and all those kind of things? And, you know, and I wish I could say the moment I got saved I was perfect, but the moment I got saved I wasn't perfect, and then shortly after I got saved I got involved in a sin that was a hideous sin, and I got involved in that sin as a Christian. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You say a Christian can't get involved in sin. Well, how about David? How about Samson? How about Solomon? How about Lot? Lot, the Bible says, was a just man. That means righteous, not it saved just Lot, not just only Lot. It meant righteous Lot. That righteous man, the Bible said, vexed his righteous soul daily with the filthy conversation of wicked. He was saved when he offered his girls to those perverts. He was saved when his, when his wife looked, turned around. I believe she was saved. Turned around, became a pillar of salt. Pretty despicable. But you see, him having God as his Savior and Christ in his heart didn't make him not still be a sinner. And you and I having Christ in our heart does not make us not still sinners. I'm still a sinner. Amen. In sin I was conceived. I received the Adamic nature when I got born. That nature from Adam and Eve, that sin nature was passed on through my birth, physical birth, and I have to have a spiritual birth to give me a spiritual, uh, uh, to save man, give me a spiritual birth. And, uh, and that happened when I was five years of age. And at that point I became a child of God. And now I have the spirit in me and I have the flesh in me and I'm in a battle. Amen. Are you with me? Okay. So it is vital and is absolutely important that we understand it. We learn how to recognize it and we develop the weapons and battle plans to be able to win. I, I lived in misery for 19 years because I never learned how to be victorious. I lived in misery for 19 years because for some reason, somewhere, nobody taught me what I'm going to try to teach you tonight. And I decided when I got into the ministry that I would try to teach this to everybody I had a chance, and especially to young people. Can I tell you this? I got saved at five. I'm glad I did, and I want children to get saved. I want them to get saved early. But I want to tell you what, there's a little bit of a curse to that. And the curse is this, is you've not really done too much wicked at five years of age. And you've never had the uh, passions of adolescence running through you yet. And you never had the freedom to get in a car with a bunch of buddies and drive down the road who could light up a cigarette or pull out a beer or, or pull out a joint. You never have dealt with any of that temptation. You're saved. And so as a saved person, you go and do something that you already know is wrong. Now, if you were lost and you didn't know it was wrong and you did it, it's a different story than when you know it's wrong and you do it. Because I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if we sin willfully after the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. What God's saying is, is that when you sin willfully, you expect that this thing's just going to all be taken care of. But no, the devil's going to use that, and you're going to live with that. I used to tell our young people in our Christian schools, you can get forgiven, and you may be able to forget your, forgive yourself. It's going to be tough sometimes. For you to forget is going to be real hard. See, God can forgive and forget, but we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, and we have a hard time forgetting. And the devil will not let you forget if he has anything to say about it. And can I tell you that the, those enemies of yours, sometimes even Christians will not let you forget. Amen. And, you know, especially if you're maybe living a little bit more righteous than somebody else, they always like to drag you down and shoot at you. Can I tell you that the only reason they shoot at people is because you don't shoot at people that are behind you. You shoot at people that are in front of you. Amen. And I've had in my life, my own family say, well, Ted, now I remember when you did this. Yeah, well, why don't we forget about that? Why do we have to keep dragging that up 
uh, because I guess because the devil's telling them to do it, or maybe because they're just trying to remind me that maybe, or maybe they feel like I think I'm better than they are, and I'm not, amen. I'm not better than anybody, amen. And tonight I'm showing you in my testimony here that I'm not better than anybody else and that I live in this battlefield. And so we have this battlefield. And so anyway, let's talk about the battle with temptation and sin. And let me give you some things. Turn to Romans chapter 6 with me very, very quickly. And I will hasten. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. My first statement, I'll give it to you, write it down if you want, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, but listen, as truly born-again Christians, we know we are not supposed to sin. Amen? That's just not, but let's put it down. As truly born-again Christians, we know, I know I'm not supposed to sin. I know I'm not supposed to lie. I know I'm not supposed to lust. I know I'm not supposed to covet. I know I'm not supposed to get angry and fly off the handle. I know I'm not supposed to say some of the things I say. The tongue is an unruly evil set on fire of hell, the Bible says, written to the Christian. Yeah, sometimes my tongue is not kind to my wife. Any of you have any of those kind of problems? You know, it's not kind sometimes. Sometimes I don't think before I speak, amen. I just let it out, and then I hurt my wife. I offend her, and I make her feel bad. And you know, I'm not supposed to do that, amen. And sometimes I, sometimes I have thoughts about people I shouldn't have. Don't get mad at me. Don't, don't be acting like I'm some kind of a weirdo or something. Hey, you know what? You do too. You know, I can judge people and I can write them off, man. I can criticize and condemn them. I can be judge, jury, and executioner. Amen. Why? Because that's a sinful man that's in me. We're not supposed to sin. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I challenge you to go home and read Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, and Romans chapter 8. Read it carefully. Read it with, with wisdom. Uh, mull over it. Meditate upon it. Chew on it. And you'll find out something there. The Bible says in that passage of Scripture that we're to be dead to sin because we're saved. We're supposed to reckon ourselves to be dead. That word reckon means to consider. It doesn't mean we're totally dead. But here's what he's trying to teach us here. He said, if you would become a dead man, if you would go to the morgue and find a corpse, and you came up to that corpse, corpse and you put a beer in front of his face, would he be tempted? Not at all. If you, would, uh, if you would say to him, look, let's go out and rob a liquor store, would he be tempted? Not at all. If you brought some, some, uh, some, uh, some woman in there to seduce him, would he be tempted? Not at all. If, 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 uh, if we brought in some coach purse, would you think that woman would be going, <gasps> oh, i got to have one of those. Not at all. Why? Because they cannot be affected because they're dead. As Christians, we're supposed to act like or get to the place where I consider, look, I don't have to do that. I'm dead to that. But we are not supposed to sin. I don't think that's rocket scientists, but it's just the first point. All of us know we're not supposed to sin. Amen? Amen. Hey, hey, did you sin today? Well, I did. Now, I didn't go kill anybody. I didn't drink. I haven't ever been in a bed with anybody except that woman right there I've been married to. Well, I'm somebody good. No. You see, a sin is, Jesus took this sin. If a man look on a woman to lust, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, amen, he took it right down the line. And he said, look, it's not just the letter of the law, but it's what's going on in here. I see your mind. Amen. I'm all the time having to confess to God and ask Him to forgive me for the thoughts I have. Lord, I was just mad. I, I, I just mad. Lord, I just said something in my heart about that brother I shouldn't have said. I mean, Lord, truth of the matter is, if I could kill him right now, I'd kill him. Man, you're a terrible person. I know the flesh is the flesh. You know what? A Christian's flesh can do anything that a lost person's flesh can do. Your flesh is no better than my flesh. My flesh is no better than their flesh. As one of my good friends says, save flesh, lost flesh, it's all flesh because flesh doesn't get saved. Amen. The flesh is always going to be wicked. And I got this wicked. Paul called it a, 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 a corpse that he carried around. 
And it's, it's a picture of what they did when somebody would kill somebody in the Roman day. They would put that dead corpse up on their back and they would lash it to their back and to their arms. And they would carry that around and that corpse would start to rot and the gangrene would set in and it'd kill them. And Paul says, this is what the flesh is like to me. It is this despicable body that I'm carrying around that is, and is having its effect upon me. It's killing me. And I want to be delivered from it. In Romans chapter 7, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He said, Here I am, the great apostle, written more new books in the New Testament than anybody else, started more churches than anybody else, sacrificed more than anybody else, and we talked about that Sunday morning. And he says, But here's what I am. I am a wretched man because I have this sin in me. And so we know we're not supposed to sin. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Then I want to say, number two, that temptation is a fact of life. It is a fact of life. And I want to say this. Take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1 with me, if you would, very quickly. It is a fact of life. And I want to make a statement. Listen carefully. It is not a sin to be tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. It is not a sin to be tempted. You are going to be tempted. Temptation is a part of life. I used to feel guilty because I was tempted. I used to think, well, I can't be saved because I'm tempted. And God, I just, I'm a, I just can't be anything. But I'm just tempted. It beat, the, beat me up. Now, I'm not for temptation. I think that you ought to get to the place where you live as, as temptation-free as you can. Amen? And that temptation, living temptation-free, comes when you start growing spiritually and you start separating. Amen? You don't run to the places where the temptation is. Look, I know places, I, I say this to young people all the time, I say it to you, there are places I can't go. Now, you might be able to go there, but I can't go there. There are people I cannot be with. There are practices that I cannot participate in. And there are periodicals or those types of things in the entertainment industry that I cannot be a part of. The television, the television just destroyed me. The television had so much filth. I'm talking back in the 60s, 50s, and 60s now, folks. 70s. You know it's worse now? And as a boy, I'd watch that stuff, and it would cause stuff to go through my mind. You know, well, you know that one guy, that guy did a murder, and he tried to blame it on because he saw it on Kojak? Well, that's ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you what. People watch that stuff, and those start, st stuff starts going through their mind. And if you're one of those people, then you need to recognize, I didn't watch this stuff. Amen. My dad would sit there and have the television on. There'd be something on there that wasn't appropriate, and it affected me because that was, I had a sin problem with that. And my dad, I'd look at my dad, and I'd say, Dad, doesn't that bother you? And he'd look at me and say, No, does it bother you? Yes. He said, Well, then turn it. Now, why? No, you, my, my dad wasn't a saint. He wasn't perfect, but that wasn't his besetting sin. That wasn't his area where he was weak. That wasn't the area where the devil could get him. But it was my area, and so I had to learn this is the area where I am weak and I am being defeated and destroyed. I'm sinning against God, so I am going to have to deal with this. Amen. But it wasn't a sin to be tempted. It's a sin when you give in to temptation. Look at James chapter 1, verse 1. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which shattered abroad, greeting, my brethren. I read that so you can understand who he's writing to. He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, here he's not talking about the temptation of the flesh. Are you listening? Here he's talking about uh, troubles. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. All right, now here's what he said. Whenever you're tempted, don't say it came from God. God will never tempt you to do evil. Amen? Now, watch verse number 14. Look at it, look at it, look at it. But, what's the next word? Every what? Is what? Every man is tempted. Mark her down, folks. That is an absolute law. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 7. When I would do good, evil is present with me. It's a law, he said. I find a law. When I would do good, evil is present with me. You're never going to get away from the evil of your flesh. It's in this body. It's in this thing. You have to carry it with you. 
that will never leave me until I die or until Jesus raptures me. As long as I'm walking in this body and breathing, uh, breathing air without having been, been transfigured by, God's, uh, by the resurrection or the rapture, you know what, then I am going to always have to fight this battle with the flesh. Amen. Temptation. Temptation. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. The sin comes at the conception. What is the conception? The conception is is when you act on the temptation. All right, so let's just say there's $500 in the offering plate down here. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Amen. Amen? And let's suppose as I'm preaching, the thought goes through my mind, take the offering. That's a terrible temptation. And I don't, I don't feel that temptation, but I'm not saying it could never come. But that temptation is not causing me to sin because it's not a sin until I do it. If I reach down in here and I take that $500 and stick it in my pocket, now the sin has been conceived. It's came to birth. Amen. It's came to fruition. And then sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now the death there is not talking about a loss of your soul. The death there is talking about all the things that die because you sin. Have you ever thought about what dies when you sin? The things that are gradually just dying in your life. You know, I, I can't listen for you tonight, but just think about it. When you commit sin, what kind of things does it cost you? And what kind of things are starting to perish and die in your life? Walk with God, relationship, friendships. You can mark her down. I mean, listen, I know of families where children have literally destroyed their relationship with their parents. And all love in the family has virtually died. All because they would not deal with their sin. Amen. Amen. It's, a, it's not a temptation to sin. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter. It's, it's not a sin to have temptation. I'm sorry. It's not a sin to have temptation. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Now listen, I'm not promoting living sinfully here. You understand that tonight? I am not promoting that. I'm teaching you that you and I cannot live uh, the Christian life without understanding this battle and starting to deal with it and make the right decisions. And can I just say this to you? God will never do for you what you need to do for yourself. I told my people pastoring for 26 years, God will never slap a beer out of your hand. Now look, I, I, dealt, with, I dealt with folks from the, from the housing authority. I dealt with people that, man, their lives were a mess. I mean, when they got, when they got saved, came to our church, I mean, whew, man, I mean, it would, some of you, would, it would just blow your mind to know their stories. And they had a long way to go. They had a lot of baggage. They had a lot of practices and, and, and characteristics and, and patterns of life that they had built up in their life that the devil wasn't going to let go of easy. So I had to tell him, you know what, look, you want to live godly, you want to live righteous, that's great, but your God's not going to do for you what you're supposed to do for yourself. He's given you the commandments of the Scripture how to deal with this. Amen. He ain't going to slap that beer out of your hand. So you got to get, you can't, you can't pick it up. He ain't going to keep you from going to that bar. So if you don't want to drink, don't go there. He ain't going to keep you out of the bed of adultery. So you need to quit running around with that guy. He is not going to take a needle out of your arm. So you need to get away from that crowd and don't buy that stuff. Amen. Now, God will always give you power and grace and make a way to escape, but God will not do the work for you. I used to teach to my people temptation, uh, temptation is like weights. I was a high school football coach and I had weight training. We called it resistance training. You know, really, that weight is an inanimate object, but you know what it's trying to do? It's trying to pin you. When you pull that thing off of that bench press and you're laying there, that weight is trying to crush you. And what you're doing is you're resisting it, trying to push it away. That's what the Bible says we're supposed to do with the devil and sin. We're supposed to resist it. Amen? I choose to tell my people, now look, that sin, is that, that weight's not going to change. Sin is always going to be sin. Temptation is always going to be temptation. 
What you have to start doing is resisting it, pushing against it. You have to start working at saying no. And, and at first you're weak and it doesn't happen very often. Amen? You pull the weight off and you're trying as best you can and the weight crushes your chest. And then you get discouraged and quit and say, well, I can't do it. But no, listen to me. You've got to keep working at it. And can I say that even though you didn't push the weight off, just the fact that you worked at it made some muscle. And you just keep working at it, it makes some more muscle. And you just keep working at it, it makes some more muscle. And here's your other thing pinned you. Now this time you get the thing about an inch off, and boom, it falls back down. Oh, I didn't get it done this time. Well, stay after it. And it gets about two inches. Boom, I didn't get it this time. Stay after it. And it's three inches, four inches, five inches, six inches. And all of a sudden, after you've been working hard to resist that temptation and not give in, you say, no! It was hallelujah! But the next day, the weight's there. And the next day, the weight's trying to pin you again. But I know this, now you've got more strength, and so you should be able to resist it. But sometimes you won't. But as long as you keep, and the more you keep doing it, and finally when you do say no, and say no, and say no, and say no, and say no, guess what happens? We get spiritual muscles. And guess what happens? That weight that used to be so difficult becomes so easy, and we learn how to throw it off. Amen? And we might even get to the place where we don't even notice that that temptation is in our life anymore. But it's a battle. It has to be fought every day. Now look there at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to have to quit. I won't even get this message done. Amen. Time to go. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Look what it says. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Can I tell you when I read that as a young man and the light finally went on in my head that every Christian has the same problem I do? It just really, it just, it just really changed my life. I finally realized for the first time in my life that I wasn't a weirdo. That everybody else wasn't perfect. And I was the only one that was having this problem. It's pretty sad to be 19 years of age before you realize because somehow I didn't catch it, somebody didn't teach it to me. I hear a lot of new converts saying, well, boy, you know what, I look like everybody in that church is perfect and I'm so wicked. Don't kid yourself. Nobody in that church is perfect. And our flesh, all of us' flesh is wicked. And the only thing that ever makes any of us more righteous and holy than anybody else is just the grace of God and the work that's happened in our life. And listen, at one point, I was right back here where that new convert was. And God began to work in my life and began to show me, and I began to start working and desiring to see God work. And if I am what I am, I like what Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen? Not because Ted Houston, somebody great, but because God was gracious enough to show me and help me and convict me and convince me and, and work with me and give me grace and help me and forgive me when I failed, amen, and love me when I was unlovely and stay by me when I, I wouldn't have stayed by me and not cast me away when I'd have cast me away and not quit on me when I'd have quit on me. We got a wonderful God. And salvation isn't just uh, we're going to go to heaven. It's God saying, I'm going to take you to heaven, and now I'm going to work in your life to try to help you to get victory over sin. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am so glad for that. Amen. Well, I'm going to say this tonight. The battle is unavoidable. Go to Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to have to quit for tonight. So next Wednesday night, I'll finish this. So if you want to hear the ending, you can come. Amen. And if you don't, then I'll understand. That you didn't want to hear the ending. Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. I want you to see this. The battle is unavoidable. The battle is unavoidable. It's just unavoidable. Listen, I'll just say this. You can separate yourself from every evil thing in the world, but you can't separate yourself from your own evil. It's in me. Paul put it this way, Romans 7. Let's, let's look at see if it's in this passage of Scripture. It's there, five, verse 22. I find then a law. Paul said, here's a law. What is a law? An immutable truth. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil, what's the next word? 
is, not might be, evil is what? Present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, that's the spirit. But I see another law in my members, that's the flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul said, look, when I do good, evil is present with me. It's an unavoidable battle. The only way I could not be tempted in this world would be to die. If I wanted to get to the place where I was never tempted, the only way I could do that is to end my life. And that is obviously not what we're supposed to do. And I'm just trying to say to you now, I'm trying to encourage you tonight, and I'll finish this up next week to try to help you to know how. I'm trying to say something to you, friend. Listen to me. You and I are in a battle. And, you know, if you're not in a real battle tonight, praise God, hallelujah. I mean, if your battles become pretty easy, praise God for that. You know, I know there are people in here tonight that probably don't need to hear this as much as other people. But I'm going to say something to you, dear friend. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And about the time you think you got it whipped and ain't going to happen to you, it'll be just the time when the devil hits you upside the head and you'll find yourself doing something and maybe ruining your life like that dear man that I talked about who just got a moment of weakness, maybe some pride. I'm a man of God and I know the Bible and I just could never do anything like that. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't you ever say you could never do anything. I'm going to tell you something. I, by the grace of God, I never want to do this. I never want to do that. I never want to do this. But I'm not going to tell you I could never do that because I could do it. You think you could kill Brother Houston? Sure I do. I do. I think I could kill if my flesh got angry enough, if I didn't control it. You see, I had a bad temper. You see, I hit doors. I did all kinds of things. I had a bad temper. You think that temper's not still there? No, I've been working on keeping that temper suppressed, keeping it under control. And that temper cut loose right now. It's in me. But I, I'm not planning on letting it come, come out. Everybody okay tonight? All right. You say, well, Brother Houston, I just thought you were an angel. You just destroyed it. Well, good, I'm glad. I, I can say this to you. I've never been in a bed with anybody but that woman right there, and we didn't do it until we got married. I've never been drunk in my life. I've never smoked a marijuana joint. I've never snorted cocaine. I've never stuck a needle in my arm. I've never killed anybody. I've never, never did armed robbery. Well, you're a good person, Brother Houston. No, I'm not a good person. There are a whole lot more sins in the world than that. And the internal sin is just as bad as the external sin. And God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You know, we got some people that walk around and they look really good. I mean, I know some guys that are almost perfect who are atheists. They're very moral. They're, they're, they're more righteous than I am, but they're atheists. Where are they going to go when they die? I know some Christians that are pretty rotten. Where are they going to go when they die? You see, you and I don't know if a person's saved or not. Only God can see the inside and make that judgment. But I'm going to tell you something. Somebody can look, look pretty good on the outside as a Christian, and the inside be full of all kinds of bad stuff. Bitterness. Bitterness is an internal sin that many people can't see. But I'll tell you what, you can feel the effects of it. Anger, wrath, malice. You know what malice is? Boy, I hope they get theirs. I heard Dr. Uh, I got to close here, but uh, he, he pastored the church down in Georgia after Curtis Hudson took the sword of the Lord. And he was having a problem with a deacon in his church. I mean, the deacon was really bad, mistreating him and saying some awfully ugly things. And he just got angry. And he went into his bedroom and he pulled out his pistol. And he got on the interstate heading to the deacon's house, was going to shoot him. 
That didn't come from God. You know that. He just let his anger get control. And he's driving down the, the interstate, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit of God said, You're a pastor? And what are you getting ready to go do? And he said his heart broke, and he pulled over to the side of the road and put the car in park and just began to bawl and sob like a baby. He said, oh, God, oh, God, I'm sorry. You know what that was? That was the devil using the flesh to destroy it, try to destroy a good man of God. Just like the devil uses the flesh to try to destroy you good people of God. And I've watched it 26 years of pastoring. I've watched people that let the devil have his way. I've watched people get angry and say things they regret. I've watched them storm out of a church, and I've seen their lives go to pot. All because they didn't recognize, look, that's not spiritual. That's not godly. That's a sin, and I need to deal with that sin. Well, next week, I'm going to show you what the Bible says to do about it, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.